Amen. Good morning. Good morning. As always, it is a blessing to be in God's house. I again want to thank Pastor Daniel for filling in for me last week and allowing me to enjoy the weekend as we celebrated my sister getting married. And she, her and her husband got to spend the week in Kauai. And uh, a wonderful time. So I'm very appreciative of him for doing that. If you have your Bible, you can go ahead and open it up to James chapter 5. And we pick back up in the book of James. <clears throat> this journey through the book of James is not an easy one. Right? It challenges us on many levels, particularly when it comes to our wants and our pride. But in the end, it's a needed beneficial challenge. Right? As we seek to be more like Christ and to be changed more into his image, we need to be challenged. We need our pride knocked down a few notches. Because in the end, all that matters is Christ and what he has called us to do and to be. That's what James has been saying so far. Have a true, genuine, growing relationship with the Lord based on what the Lord lays out for us in his word, not our preconceived ideas, and then do what it says. That's the hard part. Doing what he says, not what we want or think. Now with that said, as James begins winding down as the book is coming to a close, the guidance that he offers really spells out for us why we need to be behaving and speaking a certain way. Because it's about pointing others to Christ because he will return. And until that time comes, we will be challenged by the world. We will face trials and ridicule. But we have to be steadfast in our commitment to Christ. We have to understand when we live for Jesus, worldly minded people won't get it. And often when people don't get it, they ridicule. Let's sing this psalm in, in, in such moments. We're not going to sing it right now. Psalm 37, 1 to 7 says, Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Now that's not the whole psalm, but it captures the point. And it's this. Don't worry about what others think of you if you are doing what the Lord would want you to be doing. Let me say it again. Don't worry about what others think of you if you're doing what the Lord would want you to be doing. And that's found in here. This is one of the main points that James is seeking to make in the passage today. Be steadfast in Christ no matter what. And it's important because Jesus is returning for his bride, the church. And until that happens, we must patiently and firmly stand on the side of righteousness as we interact with a world that does not get it. So if you are able and you are willing, please stand with me as I read from God's holy scripture, James chapter 5, verses 7 to 11. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. Brothers and sisters, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. Brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering and patience. See, we count as blessed those who have endured. You have heard of Job's endurance and have seen the outcome that the Lord brought about. The Lord is passionate or compassionate and merciful. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, Lord, with thankful hearts. 
Thankful for what you do for us. Thankful for the blessings that you give to us each and every day. Lord, be with us as we hear your word this morning. Let it penetrate our hearts. Lord, let, us, let it humble us. Forgive us when we fail you. In your name we pray. Amen. Please have a seat. I have to thank Pastor Daniel. He got me a, a sweat rag. For the win. I just wanted to share that with you all. Anyone get really impatient? Anyone? Anyone get really impatient when the end of the service is nearing? I'm just kidding. Don't answer that. Don't answer it. Here's the thing. I, th I think most of us fall into this category in one way or another, right? Especially now in our society. Because we live in an instant culture, right? From social media to our food. Everything is right away. I've mentioned this before, right? But we're in the fast food line. And if we have to wait more than 10 minutes, we're upset. Centuries ago, right, news could take days, weeks, months to circulate. Even as things have advanced in technology, right, at the, at the turn of uh, the, the century, or the 19th, for news to get around the globe, it could take days or weeks still. Today, everything is right at our fingertips. We can know everything we need to know at a moment's notice. And I would say because of this, despite having this immense blessing of having things quickly, we're more impatient than ever. Y'all remember a time before cell phones? Now, if you're like 20 or younger, you may not, this doesn't make sense to you. But I remember growing up, and I'm talking about when I was growing up, not when all you were growing up, that if someone called you, they're going to have to wait till you got home. Right? If you were blessed enough to have an answering machine, which I remember when we got one at my house, that was a big deal. Right? We'll call you back. You had to wait. Right now, if we call someone on their cell phone and they don't call back or answer within minutes, we're like, Are you okay? What's going on? Why aren't you answering me? Those circumstances are different. It's clear that from this passage, patience is not a new thing. It's been a plight of sinful humanity from the beginning, and James deals with it here. But it's not just concerning anything. Right? It's a patience with our situation in life. It's a patience as we wait upon the Lord and his return. As we're going to celebrate in a few weeks, right? as J Jesus made preparations to go to the cross, to die for humanity's sins, he also was very clear about something. He would be back. And so as James is bringing everything to a close here in chapter 5, he wants the people to understand Christ is returning. Don't get impatient that he doesn't return when we want him to. We're not going to get into all of it today, but we have to understand Christ is returning. He promised that. When he promises something, he means it. In the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, it says, Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I go and I prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. Again, th there's the hope that we have in this life. When we are saved by believing in Christ, calling upon him as our Lord and our Savior, remember, hope is not something that might happen. Biblically, hope is trust in something that will happen. So with that understanding, we should be excited. 
whether he returns while we're still alive or if we pass before, right? We must wait patiently and expectantly for the Lord with joy in our hearts. We must wait patiently and expectantly for the Lord with joy in our hearts. In this instance, right, James cites how a farmer waits for his crops, right? There's this eagerness and care involved with it. Anybody ever try to grow something in their yard besides weeds, vegetables, right? Do they grow faster if you just sit there and stare at it? Seems like it takes longer, right? But there's also a, an, an excitement, right? Oh, I'm planting something. I'm doing this. This is exactly how we as believers should be, excited for Christ's return. But like a farmer, we just don't sit there and watch the crops grow. He goes on and does other tasks. So also, right, we need to be doing what he has called us to do in the meantime. That's what is meant in strengthening our hearts. Meaning, right, we're going to be tested in the meantime as we wait. We're going to be pulled towards giving up. Oh, you know what? How long have you been waiting for Jesus' to return? That just shows it's not real. Why do you do this? But the idea here is we need to be firm and pull closer towards the Lord through his word. The writer of Hebrews gives us a similar instruction in chapter 13, verse 9. He says, do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. So the idea here is what, what strengthens us in our faith? Not going to church? Not reading our Bible? No. Sound doctrine and being with the church strengthens us. Right? If, we're, if we're never pulling closer to the Lord through Bible study, if we're not pulling closer to the Lord by being around other believers, what are we then filling ourselves with? Because we're going to be filling ourselves with things that will not strengthen our faith or hearts. To strengthen our hearts in faith, we must be in the Word of God. To strengthen our hearts in faith, we must be in the Word of God. I often have people come to me, and here's the thing. I, I, I've said this before. Despite being a pastor, I am not the best Bible expert out there. All I know is what I know because I try to study his word. Right? But if we don't ever read it, and I've had people, they, they, they'll, they'll say, well, you, you know, you said this during a sermon. And by the way, I could be perfectly wrong. And I'm like, oh, well, where, 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 where in scripture, you know, is, is the counterpoint to this? Well, I don't read the Bible. I just, I just feel like that doesn't seem right. That's not being steadfast in our faith, is it? Our sinful feelings can be deceptive. All that matters is his word and what it tells us. Because it's there that we find ourselves being equipped for every good work. Meaning what? God's righteous actions for us. And we need to be doing this because this is to James's point. The Lord's return is near. We've looked at this before, but his nearness is not how we would measure nearness, right? But the question has to be asked, where do you want to find yourself when the Lord does return? That's, that's really what James is warning here is. Serving him, holding firm in the faith, sharing the gospel, or not doing any of those. For any parents or even grandparents, do you ever give your kids chores? 
do your chores, right? And you got all day to do the chores, all day. And then they hear the garage door open and they leap up and they're frantically trying to get their chores finished. I remember as a kid, my mom would be like, you need to vacuum the house. This was during the summer. And all day would go by and I'd be doing anything but chores, right? And then the moment she started coming down the driveway, I'm up and I, I am a super vacuumer, by the way. I learned and I can do it in the last moment. And she comes in, I finally finish the vacuuming and I'm like sweating, you know. That's not where we want to find ourselves when the Lord returns. Another point James is making here is impatience has a way of turning our attitude sour real quick. Right? Take, take the Israelites, for instance. We're talking about this quite a bit on Wednesday morning during our Bible study. When the Israelites, who had been brought out of slavery after 400 years, had fled the Egyptian army, God had performed miracle after miracle, delivering them and freeing them. They get to the base of a mountain. Moses goes up because he's been called by God. And what do they do? Do they go, hey, we're here. Thank you, Lord. We're going to praise and worship you. No. They decide, well, he's been gone for so long and he hasn't come back down. Let's make a false god instead. And we'll worship that. The thing is, when, when our attitudes find themselves away from the Lord, away from his promise, and away from the hope that he brings, we get impatient, we get prideful, we get negative. Then we start complaining. Nothing delights us. In the midst of blessing, we will complain. And that's what James is warning of here. If our focus gets off, then we're going to start getting negative. And we even start taking it out on those around us. If you remember back in chapter 1 of James, he called us to find joy even in our sufferings. That's a crazy notion, right? Hey, you're suffering. Be joyful, though. Why? Why would he call us to something like that? It's because if we are truly Christians, our joy is found in Christ. That's where the joy comes from. That's why we can be joyful, even when things are hard. The thing is, if our faith isn't laser-focused on Jesus... And what he does for us, then we will just find ourselves complaining about everything. What we have in Christ, salvation, is enough. Paul tells us in Philippians 2, 14 to 16, do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world by holding firm to the word of life, then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. When our negative attitudes and our impatience for what we want pushes us to sinfulness, we're going to complain, and we're going to complain about others. And we generally don't look at ourselves. We have to understand that it's not what the Lord wants from us when we do that. Because we're called to be unified in Christ. Because even though, yes, Christ's return will bring about the judgment of those who did not call upon him as Lord and Savior, there's going to be a judgment for believers too. We see in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 
so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Don't forget about this exhortation, right? This is about Christ's return. That's going to bring about judgment. And so are you behaving in a way that would reflect the holiness of God? Take what this is getting at here. Do not welcome a complaining heart, but instead look upon everything as a blessing from the Lord. Real quick, this is not to say we don't have to discuss things, right? That we don't have to deal with things. And sometimes even when we're dealing with it, we, we, it's not always easy to hear, right? But I'll add, if you have to bring something up in a negative way, or that may be a negative topic, check the motivation of your heart before you open your mouth. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. And then right on the heels of this, James begin speaking of suffering, right? Because often the things we go through in life are painful. That's our fallen sinful condition, right? Particularly in the moments of waiting. And he wants us to see this connection with patience. Because there's a blessedness involved when we endure trials of this life. What did he tell us in chapter 1, verse 12? Blessed is the one who endures trials, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So in this moment, what does he do? What does James say? He references Job. If you've never read the book of Job, I encourage you, read the book of Job. All right, we, we can't get into the full story of Job this morning, but... But this was a guy who really had to deal with it, right? It, it, it's in Scripture for us for that very reason, right? Job basically lost everything, his children, his property, his livestock. And what is Job's response? Even when times were tough and a struggle, this is what he says in Job 1, 21 to 22. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Now understand something. This is not saying that Job never sinned. It's saying in this moment of despair in his life, He didn't choose to blame other people, right? He, he didn't choose to, to, to focus on the circumstances. He remained firmly planted and committed to the Lord. He was not shaken. Likewise, do not let the things of this world shake you. Instead, stand firm in the promise of God that upholds you for eternity. Ask yourself, who is your savior? Who's your king? If it is Christ, then what is the concern? Nothing can overcome Christ. Romans 8, verse 31. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? There in Romans, Paul is responding, responding to the sufferings of life. Right? When, when we endure, we're blessed. When we know Christ as Lord, the earthly suffering that we may experience is nothing anymore because of the eternal reward. And that's really James's final point in the passage when he says, the Lord is compassionate and merciful. He isn't saying here that, that you don't have to go through the valley. 
But when we go through the valley and we hold firm to him, how much sweeter is that mountain? Because in the end, when we know Christ as Savior, we know our God loves us and saves us. You know this verse. What does John 3, 16 and 17 tell us? For God so loved the world in his way, he gave his one and only son, that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And there it is. That's it. James wants us to be eagerly awaiting the return of Christ but also making sure we're living the life that he expects of us as we wait. Not defined by the world, but defined by him. And to make sure as we are doing that, that we don't let the sinfulness of this world and the desires of worldliness pull us away from our commitment to Christ. Because in the end... His love for us will save us. And that's what we need more than anything. That's the launching point. We've got to understand something. The rest of this, living the godly life, doesn't matter in the end if we don't know Christ as Lord and Savior. That's the foundation. That's the starting point. And that's the point that James has been making through this whole book. Have an earthly Genu- or not an earthly, a godly, emphasized, true, genuine relationship with Jesus. That's what he's getting at. Remember, we can't play lip service with God. He knows our hearts. He knows if we're just saying, well, I'm doing this just because it looks good, or, I, I, you know, I know that sounds good, but I, I enjoy calling the shots in my life. I said this like the first week. If you have a problem with authority, if you have a problem with pride, it's hard to be a Christian. Because we have to bow before the Lordship of Christ. Because he's the only one that can deal with our sin problem. Say it every week. From the moment sin entered our world, we needed to be saved. Because despite our best efforts, and you all know, we still sin. That's why we need him. That's why we truly need to bow our knee and put our faith and our trust in him. We need that forgiveness. If you've never truly given your life to Christ and said, yes, Jesus, I believe, make today that day. Only you can do it. And it's as simple as saying, yes, Jesus, I believe. And when we mean it in our heart, he knows. That's why we wait upon him. Because he wants people to be saved What are we told in 2 Peter 3, 9? The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. 